So here we are today, now looking at this idea of living by principle. We are in our third class in Hezekiah's life. We've looked at his background, we've looked at his Passover, and what we are going to be doing today is we're really going to look at kind of the time that the Kings and Chronicles record doesn't cover all that much, but that we see, I think, a little more of a glimpse of in the, prophet, in the prophecy of Isaiah. So we're going to be looking at the time between Hezekiah's Passover, which happened in his first year, and the Assyrian invasion, which happened in his 14th year. So what took place over that period of time? That's going to be our goal. We're going to look at, first of all, Israel's destruction and what that would have meant to the people in Judah. Then we'll spend some time looking at Hezekiah's rebellion against the Assyrians and just the timing and context of all of this, how this all really came together. Now, this is going to be the bulk of what we spend time doing because I think always in Bible study, you have to look at the context. What does this, what was happening at this time that really affected Hezekiah and that impacted the way that he thought about things. So that's what we're going to try and do. We're, we're going to attempt to really see um, what was happening around the time of the Assyrian invasion and beforehand. Now our why question for today, we only have one. If you'll just turn with me to 2 Kings chapter 18. I think we need to read this just very quickly first before we ask our why question. 2 Kings 18. You'll read a few verses there that seem very curious. After all that we've read about Hezekiah and his faith and the Passover that he initiated, the way that he wasn't going to compromise, in 2 Kings 18 it says, starting in verse 13, 2 Kings 18 verse 13, Now in the fourteenth year of King Hezekiah did Sennacherib, king of Assyria, come up against all the fenced cities of Judah and took them. And Hezekiah, king of Judah, sent to the king of Assyria to Lachish, saying, I have offended. Return from me. That which thou puttest on me will I bear. And the king of Assyria appointed unto Hezekiah, king of Judah, 300 talents of silver and 30 talents of gold. And Hezekiah gave him all the silver that was found in the house of the Lord and in the treasures of the king's house. What we have there in that set of verses is perhaps maybe one of the anomalies of Hezekiah's reign. You read about this faithful king. The beginning of, of 2 Kings 18 is all about his reform how he went into the temple and how he cleansed it and he took out Nehushtan. And then it says, and he rebelled against the king of Assyria. And somehow, in the midst of that rebellion, initiated by Hezekiah, he sends a message to Sennacherib saying, I have offended that which thou puttest on me, I will bear, please go home. And so we have to ask ourselves, what was going on? Why did Hezekiah surrender? Why do we have this strange set of verses here? And even more so, you may have noticed there in verse 15 that he takes all the silver from the Lord's house, from Yahweh's house, and the treasures there, and verse 16 tells us that he takes the gold from the doors of the temple, and that just so happens to be the same thing that Ahaz had done so many years earlier when he said to the king of Assyria in 2 Kings 16, I am thy servant and thy son. He takes the money from the treasury. He cuts the gold off the doors of the temple. Exact same thing. What is Hezekiah thinking and what happened? So that's going to be our big question for today. Now, just this is spoiler alert. In case you're you know, really excited about this question, I'll have to tell you we're not actually going to answer it until tomorrow. <laughs> so, you know, there you go. But it's important, I think, we have to really build up our context here in order to understand a little bit about this answer to the question. So our big lesson for today, now, do you remember the others, first of all? First one is God is working all things for good, right? Second is God wants us to remember the past. And now today's is we live by principle, not results. Now, we're going to see what this means, I think. And just to give you a little bit of an idea as to where we're going with this, is that we are in such a results-driven society Right? You go to work and you're told you have to produce this. It, you know, if you're at home with the children, you have this idea of you have to create children that are like this. Right? It's all about results. Everything is about the results of it. And we don't often think about the process. And yet, I would suggest to you that what God is continually showing to us is the idea that the process is what matters. And He controls the results. 
Supplemental lesson. Hybrid worship is not acceptable. Now, we actually get three supplemental lessons today. So that's, that's you know, pretty exciting. We can't make others' choices, and instead, we give them the tools for change. So principle, not results. That's the big lesson for today, and we're going to see, I think, in a powerful way how this comes out in the life of Hezekiah and then how this applies to us as well. So that's our plan. Well, Hezekiah did his Passover and his reform in the first year. And a few years later, the king of Assyria came down, the fourth year. And unfortunately, only a few of those in Israel had been willing to humble themselves. So some people came, they listened to Hezekiah's message, they came, they were encouraged, they went back into Israel and they tore down the idols. But those were just a few, just a few in Ephraim and Manasseh. And the whole nation stayed in its evil ways. In fact, even more so, I think they got worse. If you'll just come with me now to Hosea chapter 8, just take a look at how the prophet Hosea, a contemporary prophet with Hezekiah, notice how he describes them. As we read this now in Hosea 8, look for Israel's progression in wickedness. What shows us here that Israel was getting worse over the years? Hosea chapter 8, we're going to start at verse 5. Look for Israel getting worse. Hosea 8 and verse 5. It says there, verse 5, Thy calf, O Samaria, hath cast thee off. Mine anger is kindled against them. How long will it be ere they attain to innocency? For from Israel was it also. The workmen made it, therefore it is not God, but the calf of Samaria shall be broken in pieces. Now again, I think this is why uh, one of the things that really helps when we read slowly, we read carefully, and we think about it, did you notice where this calf is located? This is Samaria, right? And notice that this isn't plural calves, right? I know Samaria was the capital of Israel, but I would suggest to you that if this was talking about Jeroboam's calves, it would have said, thy calves, O Samaria. But what it says here instead is, thy calf, Samaria, as though the city of Samaria itself had a calf. Now, the reason that that's strange is because Jeroboam set up golden calves, and he put one in... Bethel, and the other in Dan, never Samaria. And yet Hosea comes along and he says, Samaria, your calf is going to be broken apart, not your calves. I don't think he was talking about the calves in Bethel and Dan, but specifically there was a calf in Samaria in the capital city. And so I think what you see is that, you know, we keep having this message that, that goes through every king of Israel that says, and he walked in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat who made Israel to sin, right? That's Jeroboam's tagline. You see it in almost every king. And yet it wasn't just that they walked in the ways of Jeroboam. But as we come to the time of Hezekiah, the time of Hosea, I think we actually see they walked in the ways of Jeroboam and added to it so that this worship now is spreading. So they continue to get worse then. This is what we see happening in Israel. And so king of Assyria comes in 2 Kings chapter 18, 2 Kings chapter 18, the king of Assyria comes in Hezekiah's fourth year, so three years after the Passover. He comes in Hezekiah's fourth year. He encamps against the city of Samaria, and it takes him how many years to take it? Three years. He takes it in the sixth year of Hezekiah. And that was it. Now, think back to what you were doing three years ago. Can you remember that? 2012? Think back to what you were doing three years ago. This is how long Judah sat watching the siege in the north. Now, you know, you might think, oh, well, I mean, it didn't really affect them, so what would it really matter? But just, just think about this. Judah had just celebrated this Passover, right? They were, they were beginning to reunite on the grounds of truth. And not only that, but just consider that these really were sister nations so there were likely those who had family in Judah, or those who had family in Israel. And they heard about the siege that was going on. Not only that, but Judah had also just been idol worshipers, right? Just like, just like Israel. It wasn't just as though Judah had always been this holy nation, but up until Hezekiah, you know, Judah had been doing the same thing. So you can imagine the people in Judah thinking, whoa, this is what came on them. Is that going to happen to us? Not only that, they were also in the same position. 
You might recall that uh, at the time of Israel, the reason that the king of Assyria came down, the reason that Shalmaneser came down on Samaria was because they were a vassal state and they refused to pay tribute. So they were actually in the same position as Judah. They were both vassal states to Assyria. So you have Judah's idol worshipers, you have them as an Assyrian vassal state. Not only that, Israel claimed to follow Yahweh. If you look at what Jeroboam set up, notice that he says, these be thy gods, O Israel, which is a direct reference back to Aaron's setting up of the golden calf, in which Aaron said, and tomorrow we will have a feast to, not the cows, to Yahweh. So I would suggest to you that Jeroboam had set up this hybrid worship where they were worshiping Yahweh, but actually following these calves. And so Israel said, hey, we're following Yahweh. And you can just imagine in Judah, the people thinking, is that the same way with us? Have we just been professing to follow him for so long? And, and yet, we, you know, we have this hybrid worship. Are the Assyrians coming on us too? And you know what I think would be really powerful is uh, just turn over now to Micah chapter 1 and take a look at this. Micah chapter 1. Look at what it is that uh, was prophesied about Samaria. Micah chapter 1. Again, this is a contemporary prophet with Hezekiah. And take a look at verse 6. And if you haven't connected these verses yet, this might be just a helpful, a helpful little uh, note to make in your margin. Micah chapter 1 and verse 6. It says, Therefore I will make Samaria, notice what would happen, as a heap of the field. Samaria would become a heap of of the field. Now hold your hand there and turn over to Micah chapter 3. Because in Micah chapter 3, guess what's said about Judah? Micah 3 and verse 12. Therefore shall Zion, verse 12, for your sake be plowed as a field. It's the same thing. So in, in chapter 1, Micah says Samaria is going to become a field. Two chapters later, he says, and Zion, you're, you're up next. So you can just imagine here that uh, here's the people in Judah sitting here in fear for three years as they watch Samaria wither underneath the hand of Assyria. They're in the same position. They had just turned from their idols. And some of them probably would have been thinking, but I thought, I thought Israel had a reform with us at the Passover. Didn't, didn't they start to turn back to Yahweh? Is this what Yahweh is going to do to us? And so I think you can see that at this time in Judah, for three years, fear would have overtaken the people as they watched their sister nation fall apart underneath the hand of Assyria. Wondering, is our time coming? And you know what they would find out? Is that indeed, about eight years later, it was because it wasn't just that the king of Assyria was going to come down. But if you turn back now to 2 Kings chapter 18, you'll notice that Hezekiah actually does the exact same thing then that the king of Israel, Hoshea, had done in rebelling against the king of Assyria. It's likely, uh, just like Hoshea had refused to pay tribute, it's likely then I would suggest to you that, Hoshea, that uh, Hezekiah did the same thing. It says there in verse 7, 2 Kings 18, verse 7, And the Lord was with him, and he prospered whithersoever he went forth. And he rebelled against the king of Assyria, and served him not. He smote the Philistines even unto Gaza, and the borders thereof from the tower of the watchman to the fenced city. So what Hezekiah does now is he rebels against the king of Assyria, likely refusing to pay tribute, just like Hoshea had done. And now, can you feel the fear? Can you imagine what the people in Judah would have been saying? What did Hezekiah do? Didn't he see what happened to Israel? What was he thinking? The, the Assyrians are going to come down in the same way, just like what Micah had said. So you can almost feel the pressure coming here on Hezekiah. Now, you can just imagine the people's fear. And what's odd then, when you really start to put this picture together, is you start to feel a little bit, I think, of what Hezekiah started to feel. Because what's odd is that, as we read, even he backs down. Sennacherib comes and he says, I've offended. I rebelled. Give me the tribute again. Whatever you put on me, I'll bear. So we ask the question, why? Was it just because the people were afraid? 
Or was it because Hezekiah was afraid? Or was there something else? Was there something else going on? Maybe another Bible hero. Something else that was motivating Hezekiah. Remember, when we come to people in Scripture, we always have to ask this. Why? Why did they do that? Why were they thinking that? So we're going to try and put together our context. This is what we're going to attempt to do. We're going to try and understand the timing of Hezekiah's rebellion and and what was happening there. Look at the different steps. We're then going to try and understand the enemy. Who were the Assyrians? We're going to see that... uh, If you liked your skin, you probably didn't want to fight the Assyrians. So who were the Assyrians? But then on top of that, we also want to understand the nation. What were the people like that Hezekiah was dealing with at the time? Were they the same kind of people that had offered suddenly, that had willingly offered, that had made the covenant? Or did things change in 14 years? So let's just take a look at this. Now, one of the things that uh, you may have noticed, we read through it briefly, And again, this is just where Scripture gives all these details, right? And you have to ask, why are these here? So take a look at this again. In 2 Kings 18, verse 7, we have an odd little detail that you wonder, what does this mean? And how does this impact anything? 2 Kings 18, verse 7, The Lord was with him, and he prospered whithersoever he went forth. He rebelled against the king of Assyria and served him not. He smote the Philistines, even unto Gaza, and the borders thereof, from the tower of the watchman to the fenced city. Did you see the strange detail? Why does it say that Hezekiah fought against the Philistines? Right? It says he fought against Assyria. They were the superpower. You know, this was the big deal. And then almost as, as if it's a, you know, respectfully, almost as if this was like a throwaway comment, it says, oh, and he fought the Philistines. Right? Why does it say that? There must be a reason. Well, do you know what's interesting? Is uh, just take one guess. Who do you think ruled over the Philistines at the time? We're looking at the Assyrians. Now, when you put this together, you can start to see, I think, really what's going on here. He smites the Philistines. He rebels against the king of Assyria. Same time, he fights against the Philistines. Now, what's the significance of that? Well, if you just come over now to Isaiah chapter 20, take a look at this. We always have to ask why. And often when we ask these things, we'll see that Scripture has the answers. Isaiah 20, verse 1. Isaiah chapter 20 and verse 1. This is Hezekiah's rebellion against the Assyrians. Although this, at least what we're reading now, is just slightly before that. Isaiah chapter 20 and verse 1. Here's how we know. In the year that Tartan came unto Ashdod, when Sargon, the king of Assyria, sent him, and fought against Ashdod, and took it. Then we're given a prophecy now about Egypt. What we want to notice here is the timing in verse 1. So we have Ashdod. Ashdod is one of the five cities of Philistines, right? So Tartan now is being sent against the Philistines. And notice who sends him. Sargon, the king of the Assyrians. Now, Sargon doesn't show up very often, but uh, if you want a little bit of a timeline here, Here's what we have. Shalmaneser, he's the one who died when uh, besieging Samaria. He died in the midst of the siege. Shalmaneser. After Shalmaneser came Sargon, and after Sargon came Sennacherib. Now, Sennacherib is the one who came against Hezekiah. So what we have is Shalmaneser attacks Israel. In between that time of Israel being attacked and of Judah being attacked by Assyria, Sargon sends his troops down under Tartan to go take Philistia. And that happens. So he takes the Philistines, and as part of his rebellion then, Hezekiah says, Philistines, you're controlled by Assyria. Are you ready? I'm coming. And this seems to be Hezekiah, the beginning of Hezekiah's rebellion. He says, I'm not doing the tribute, and I'm taking back the land. Now, there's reasons as to why I think uh, Hezekiah specifically chose the Philistines. And if you want to talk to me about that later, uh, I'd be happy to do that. But... uh, That's not something that will fit into 45 minutes. So we have Sargon here. Now, just to put together a chronology, it's helpful. One of the things that's neat about the story of Hezekiah, perhaps you've looked at it before, is that not only do we have the scriptural record of it, but we also have Sennacherib's record. You can read Sennacherib's prism. Now, when you read it, part of it's almost like a joke. I mean, you, you've probably seen it before where, where Sennacherib writes, and Hezekiah, I shut up like a caged bird, 
right? And the splendor of my majesty overcame him. You know, all these things. Sennacherib had a pretty big head, so it seems. And, uh, you know, he, he wrote all those things. So you have to take it with a grain of salt. But it also helps, I think, in certain places because it fits with the biblical record in terms of chronology. So just take a look at this. What I would put to you that we're going to see now is that in Hezekiah's rebellion, he takes the Philistines, and Sennacherib now says, what are you doing, Hezekiah? And he comes down into the land of the Philistines by the Mediterranean, Sennacherib does, and from there he goes into Judah. So this is what we're going to see in the chronology. Sennacherib comes down, takes the Philistines back, and then goes into Judah. So here's what he says. The officials, nobles, and people of Ekron, so that's another Philistine city, who had thrown Padai, their king, bound by oath and curse of Assyria, into fetters of iron and had given him over to Hezekiah the Jew, he kept him in confinement like an enemy. So Hezekiah was holding the, the king of Ekron, right? Because he had taken over the Philistines. I drew near to Ekron, slew the governors and nobles who had committed sin, that is, rebelled, and hung their bodies on stakes around the city. Now, uh, Assyria, right? This is what they like to do. Padai, their king, I brought out of Jerusalem, set him on the royal throne over them, and imposed upon him my kingly tribute. Now, at first when you read that, you might be tempted to say, oh, it sounds like he took Jerusalem. But we know he never did, right? So I think what we have here is Sennacherib comes, he goes to Ekron, he says, Hezekiah, where's my king? Give me my king back. And Hezekiah eventually does. Now, we start to see that when we continue to read through this prism. So he takes over Philistia, he forces Hezekiah to hand over the king, he goes towards Judah. This is what he then goes on to say. As for Hezekiah the Jew, who did not submit to my yoke, the cities of his which I had despoiled, so now this is after he goes into Ekron. So from Ekron, the land of the Philistines, he goes into Judah, and he takes all these cities of Hezekiah's, which I had despoiled, I cut off from his land, and, oh look, and to Padai, king of Ekron, and, now, what an awesome name, right? And to Silibel, king of Gaza, I gave. So he gives it to Padai and to Silibel. And thus I diminished his land, I added to the former, look at this, I added to the former, that is Hezekiah, tribute, and laid upon him the giving up of their land, as well as imposts, gifts for my majesty. So what we have going on here is Hezekiah goes into the land of the Philistines. He takes it over. Sennacherib says, Hezekiah, what are you doing? He goes down into the land of the Philistines again. He takes Ekron. He says, Hezekiah, Padai, give me my king, right? Hezekiah says, whoa, okay, here. Gives him the king. Sennacherib puts him back on the throne of Ekron. And then he goes and he starts taking the cities in Judah. And as he does so... He then says, I added to the former tribute. That's 2 Kings 18, verse 13. Hezekiah says, that which thou puttest on me, I will bear. It's an accurate tribute. Now, in case you're thinking, man, I wish this was like laid out in a list somehow. You don't have to worry or wait any longer. Because we have it right here. So Hezekiah rebels against Assyria, 2 Kings 18, verse 7. He then attacks the Philistines and took over their land, 2 Kings 18, verse 8. Sennacherib then marches towards the south, towards the Philistines in retaliation, 2 Kings 18, 13. His invasion first takes the land of the Philistines, as he says in his oriental prism. Then Sennacherib goes into Judah, defeating the fenced cities. And finally, Hezekiah and his princes surrender. Now, I don't know about you, but I really like maps. Now, this, was a, this is a new phenomenon. It uh, happened ever since Ruth and I got married. She had these books all about maps. You know, I, don't, I don't know what was with her in maps, but it, uh, you know, now she's got me into it. So here's a map for you. So you can check out this map, and I, I think this, this just helps you to really visualize it and see what's going on. So here's our map. Hopefully you can see a little bit of this. You can at least see here's, here's uh, the Dead Sea. Here's the Mediterranean Sea. This is Judah down here. This would be the land of the Philistines, Ashtaroth, uh, Gaza, Ashdod. So what happens? Number one, Hezekiah rebels against Assyria. There's our big Assyrian X. Get the Assyrians out of there. He then goes and he attacks the Philistines. Boom. Battle. Sennacherib then says, Hezekiah, what are you doing? He goes in and he takes them, and he takes the whole land of the Philistines. Then Sennacherib comes into Judah, and he takes a number of the fenced cities. Okay. So that's what we're looking at there. 
So I would suggest to you that this is the chronology based off of the prism and whatnot. And this, again, helps us to really build up what was going on at the time. Now, that was the timing. As far as the Assyrian enemy, it's helpful to just understand who it was that Hezekiah was up against. So, in 2 Kings chapter 19, this is the story of Rabshakeh. Now, we talk about this a lot in the part two of Hezekiah, but I just want to touch on this very quickly. The story of Rabshakeh. He comes to Jerusalem, and do you remember what he says to Hezekiah? He says, Hezekiah, think back a few years ago. You knew a few other nations, didn't you? You knew a uh, city-state called Sepharvaim. You knew of a city-state called Arpad. You knew of a city-state called Hamath. You don't know them anymore, do you? Because they're gone. This is how the Assyrians functioned. And he just stands up and he lists all these city-states and he says, guess what, Hezekiah? No one ever wins against the Assyrians. And he brings out his big list. No one ever wins. These were the Assyrians. This was the superpower that comes, it fights, it wins. It comes, it fights, it wins. And it never knew anything else. And so this is who Hezekiah is fighting against. You know, in Nahum 3, verse 19, God says, he's talking about Nineveh, right? The capital of Assyria. And he says, upon whom has not come your unceasing evil? Upon whom has not come your unceasing evil? And so really, this was Assyria. Every single nation they came to. Boom, they defeated them. Boom, they defeated them over and over. And not only did they have this winning streak, but they were brutal. I mean, Rabshakeh says, by the way, we went to these cities and we destroyed them utterly. It wasn't just like we came in and we said, hey, surrender, right? We came in and when we left, they were gone. Again, Nahum says unceasing evil, right? That's probably not something that's pretty good. So unceasing evil. Not only that, this is just historically. Here's what the Assyrians like to do. So as we read this now, just think about how this would have affected Hezekiah. Because you'll notice that in this quote, we actually have a description of the kind of nation that Hezekiah was, that Judah was. It says here in the beginning, a final factor in the effectiveness of the Assyrian military machine was its ability to create a climate of terror as an instrument of warfare. The aim of the Assyrians was to encourage their enemies to surrender quickly rather than face a series of atrocities. King Asher Nasipal II wrote, I fixed up a pile of corpses in front of the city's gate. I flayed the nobles, as many as had rebelled, and spread their skins out on the piles. I flayed many within my land and spread their skins out on the walls. Note that this policy of extreme cruelty to prisoners was not used against all enemies, but was reserved primarily for those who were already part of the empire and then rebelled against Assyrian rule. Well, isn't that wonderful? That just so happens to be Hezekiah. And so what you see is that as Rabshakeh comes up to Hezekiah, he says, hey, Hezekiah, do you like your skin? Because guess what my ancestors have done? Right? I mean, this is, this is the unspoken threat that's hanging over Jerusalem, that you know, the skins of their enemies are put up on the wall on piles of corpses, and they never lost. And so he says, Hezekiah, it's only a matter of time before you're in that pile of bodies too. And so you can just imagine now, this is the intensity of what Hezekiah is dealing with. That here he comes, he rebels, he fights against the Philistines, Sennacherib flashes down into the land of the Philistines, he takes over Philistia and he says, do you see how easily I did that, Hezekiah? Give me my king back now. And so he does, and he says, now I'm coming for you. Say goodbye to your skin. So what you have then, as you start to look at, uh, at the nations, or at the nation of Judah, and you try and understand, we've seen the, the timing, we've seen the enemy, now we want to understand the people. See what it was that Hezekiah was really working with as he tries to, to galvanize the people to stand against Assyria. And what we see is that in the nation, there's this very strange dichotomy. And it looks a little bit like this. On one side, you have Hezekiah. You probably had people like uh, Isaiah and Micah along with him as well. Hezekiah few in number. And on the other side, you had the people, you had the priests, and you had the princes. It was essentially Hezekiah and his few friends against everyone else. 
And as you start to read through the prophets, you suddenly realize the dire situation that Hezekiah found himself in. Just take a look here. This is the situation of the people at the time in which Hezekiah rebelled. So this is now, uh, context here is our Assyrian invasion. We're in Deuteronomy 28. This is a prophecy, I guess, about the Assyrian invasion. Deuteronomy 28, go ahead and turn over there now. And I want us to read this because this has been fulfilled a number of times, but I think it has a specific application to the Assyrian invasion. And we'll see why. Deuteronomy 28, we're going to read now verse 49 and then skip over to 52. Deuteronomy 28, verse 49, then 52. It says there, verse 49, The Lord shall bring a nation against thee from far, from the end of the earth, as swift as the eagle flieth, a nation whose tongue thou shalt not understand. So, foreign nation coming against them. So far fits the Assyrians. Verse 52, notice what he would do. And he shall besiege thee in all thy gates, until thy high and fenced walls come down, wherein thou trustest throughout all thy land. He shall besiege thee in all thy gates throughout all thy land, which the Lord thy God hath given thee. Now, I think it's, uh, what, 2 Kings 18, verse 13? Something like that. Do you remember what cities it was that Scripture tells us Sennacherib specifically destroyed? He fought against the fenced cities. Yeah, and Lachish, specifically. Lachish, specifically. And yes, and Laish as well. Those were the fenced cities. So what we have right here in verse 52 is it says he's going to come against all your high and fenced walls. And that's exactly what happens during the Assyrian invasion. He comes against the fenced cities. And now you, you'll recall Deuteronomy 28 is the chapter about the blessings and the cursings. And that all these things would come upon them if they were unfaithful. And so what we see is that, oddly enough, despite the fact that Hezekiah celebrated this Passover and that he said, we're going to make a covenant with our God, renew our faith, that all of a sudden, the curses of Deuteronomy 28 are coming on Hezekiah's nation. What does that mean? Strange, isn't it? The Assyrians were coming, I would suggest to you, because of the people's wickedness. They were being cursed. And you know what's odd is that when you start to read through the prophets then, in the section that the Kings and Chronicles record, you know, it, it jumps about eight years from the Passover now, or from the destruction of Israel to Hezekiah's rebellion. And the prophets really tend to fill in this time so that you can see what was happening with the people. Notice how they're described now in Isaiah chapter 10. This is about the Assyrian invasion. O Assyrian, verse 5, the rod of mine anger, and the staff in their hand is my indignation. Look at how the nation is described. I will send him against a hypocritical nation. And against the people of my wrath will I give him a charge to take the spoil and to take the prey and to tread them down like the mire of the streets. Quick question. What's a hypocrite? How would you define a hypocrite? A play actor, right? So he looks like he's doing one thing, and you almost have this idea that it's not just like, you know, he accidentally ends up doing something else, but it's as though he's doing it to look good or to show a certain persona when he's really something totally different. And so God says, my nation is a bunch of hypocrites, and that's who I'm going to send the Assyrians against. That's strange, isn't it? A bunch of hypocrites. What does that mean? How could you have a bunch of hypocrites during the time of Hezekiah? Well, I would put to you that here's the reason. Can you imagine blatant idol worship happening during the time of Hezekiah? Can you picture Hezekiah waking up in the morning and walking down the streets of Jerusalem and saying, oh, look, there's the idol to Molech. Well, I don't worship at that one. Oh, look, there's the, uh, the idol to Baal. Well, I don't worship at that one either. The people do, but it's okay. Can you imagine that? Like, not at all. There were not going to be these open idols in Jerusalem. That would not be something that would have happened. And yet, you know what's strange is that if you keep reading through Isaiah chapter 10, look for something surprising. Verse 11. Shall I not, as I have done unto Samaria and her idols, so do to Jerusalem and her idols? Wherefore, it shall come to pass that when the Lord hath performed his whole work upon Mount Zion and on Jerusalem, I will punish the fruit of the stout heart of the king of Assyria and the glory of his high looks. What does this tell us about Judah? Do you notice how it's described? 
Jerusalem and her idols. But they wouldn't have had idols during Hezekiah's time unless the people had idols. Now, I would suggest to you that this is what's meant by a hypocritical nation. That the people said to Hezekiah, oh, we love Yahweh. We go and we sacrifice to him. We come to the temple. We, we sing our songs with the Levites. We say our prayers. And then they went into their houses and they bowed down to their idols. And God says, you're a bunch of hypocrites. You have no idea what it really means to worship me. Now, I think we'll see that again, in fact. This isn't just an isolated occurrence in the prophecy of Isaiah. But if you turn over now to Isaiah 24, just take a look again. Isaiah 24, here's what it says about the people. Now, as we read Isaiah 24, look for how we know that this is specifically about Judah. Isaiah 24, how do we know that this is about Judah? Verse 5. Isaiah 24, verse 5. The earth also is defiled under the inhabitants thereof because they have transgressed the laws, changed the ordinance, broken the everlasting covenant. Therefore hath the curse devoured the earth, and they that dwell therein are desolate. Therefore the inhabitants of the earth are burned, and few men left. How do we know that this is about Judah? Because it says the earth, doesn't it? It says there, right at the end of verse 5, they broke the everlasting covenant. This is about God's relationship with the Jews, the people of the covenant. And he says, I'm going to curse you. I'm going to curse your land because of your wickedness. Now, you'll see it again in Isaiah 27. We won't go there. But God says, my people will go into captivity because they have no understanding. They don't know me. They, they say they know me, and then they go into their houses and they worship their idols. And so this is what we see at the time of Hezekiah. This is tragic. Right, here's Hezekiah initiating these reforms, and the people are touched for two weeks, maybe a few more, but they don't really change. Now, here's the reason why. When you start to look, it wasn't just the people, but in fact, it was the priests and the princes that seemed to be the same way. So the priests, what was the job of the priests? I guess I have it up there, the teachers. Right? The priests were supposed to teach. So you'll see that there in those two verses, Leviticus 10, 11, Malachi 2, verse 7. The priests were the teachers. And yet when you start to do a study on the priests at the time of Hezekiah, it starts to get scary when you see how terrible the priests were. Just when we look at this, you know, try and imagine having a time in which the arranging brethren of your ecclesia act like these priests acted. So the priests... 2 Chronicles 29, verse 34, we read that the priests were not sanctified. Hezekiah came to them and he said, sanctify yourselves and the house so that we can get things going again. Two weeks later, he comes to the priests and he says, what happened? All the Levites are sanctified. They're more upright in heart. Priests, you haven't done anything. I asked you to be sanctified and you didn't. 2 Chronicles 30, two months from then, right, when they celebrate the Passover, or sorry, a month later, one month later, in verse 24, it says, there was a great number of the priests that sanctified themselves. They had six weeks to do this. And then the Passover comes, and oh, oh, we better get sanctified to do the Passover. Right? I mean, what were they thinking? All the Levites had already done this, and yet the priests hadn't. These are the priests. These were the people that were supposed to teach the people. Now, here's where it gets really scary. Turn over to Isaiah 28. And this is how Isaiah the prophet now describes the priests at the time of Hezekiah. Isaiah 28 and verse 7. This again matches up with our time frame of the Assyrian invasion. Isaiah 28 verse 7. This chapter is, is all about that. And here's how it describes the priests. Verse 7. But they also have erred through wine. And through strong drink are out of the way. The priest and the prophet have erred through strong drink. They're swallowed up of wine... They are out of the way through strong drink. They err in vision. They stumble in judgment. For all tables, listen to this, are full of vomit and filthiness so that there is no place clean. These priests didn't just drink some wine, but they got so drunk that they were vomiting all over the temple. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine you go to an arranging brothers meeting and you walk inside the hall and it's covered in vomit because the arranging brethren have been drinking, right? This is utterly ridiculous what the people have been doing. The priests, these were the teachers. And this is what Hezekiah had to deal with. 
This is how Micah describes them. Micah 3, verses 10 and 11. They build up Zion with blood. Jerusalem with iniquity. The heads thereof judge for reward. And here's what the priests did. The priests thereof teach for hire. Oh, you, you want a specific thing said? Well, uh, how much have you got? These were the priests. The prophets thereof divine for money. Yet will they lean upon the Lord and say, Is not the Lord among us? None evil can come upon us. This is what Hezekiah was up against. So that was the teachers. Now, as far as the princes go, they were perhaps even scarier. Here's how Micah describes them as those who build up Zion with blood, as we just saw. In chapter 7, he says, The prince asks for a reward, right? Sure, I'll do whatever judgment you want, but it'll cost you. That was the prince. Micah chapter 7 and verse 4, he describes them as those who are sharper than a thorn hedge. So you, you get this idea that these are those that will say, sure, I'll give you your judgment. And you pay them, and they turn it around on you. Right? These are the kind of people that will strike you like a serpent. In Hosea chapter 5, he says, they are those that remove the bound. Remember that? You have the ancient landmark. We're told, remove not the ancient landmark. Right? This is how they were able to tell where one person lived and where the other person's uh, land started. And the princes were those who moved them. So you got this idea that they're sharper than a thorn hedge, right? Dishonest. That, you know, they walk around at nighttime. Oh, look, a boundary stone. Hmm. I'll just move that a little bit. Put it back down. Oh, you thought the border was over there? No, I, I'm pretty sure I've seen it here for a long time. Right? This is, this is how these princes were. They'd be, they were cheaters. They were liars. And they built up Zion with blood. Now, the reason that I think this is so scary is that that's how the prophets describe them. And yet, when you start to read through the story of Hezekiah, do you know what it says? It says, And Hezekiah gathered together his princes, and he said, How will we celebrate the Passover? And the princes say, Oh, Hezekiah, let's do it like this. Let's do it like this. And he says, How will we create reform? And the princes say, Let's do it like this and this. And then Hezekiah says, We're going to rebel against Assyria. And the princes say, no, we're not. Because they're two-faced. And they're going to love Hezekiah. And they're going to support Hezekiah. As long as he does what they want him to do. And when he doesn't, all of a sudden, Hezekiah finds himself very alone. Now, just to bring this all together. What we find ourselves looking at now, as we approach the time period in between Hezekiah's rebellion and his Passover, is we look at this and we say, these people were terrible. And, and you think, wow, you know, Hezekiah did this whole Passover and he, he threw himself into this idea, and I thought the people changed, but I guess they didn't. And so you come out of this saying, was Hezekiah's Passover and reform a failure? Did he fail? And I think that's where the message comes out very powerfully. Because the nation didn't change. But God wants us to live by principle and not result. So let me just tell you what I mean by this. We have two minutes. We're going to skip this first example. Turn over with me to 1 Samuel chapter 14. There's some pretty Hebrew for you. You'll have to wait and find out what that says. 1 Samuel chapter 14. 1 Samuel 14 is actually... What, this is today's reading, isn't it? Or is it tomorrow? Anyway, we'll get to it soon. 1 Samuel 14. And uh, this is the story of Jonathan and his armor bearer. Now, I'm just going to read these verses to you quickly because I think sometimes we miss something as we read this. Jonathan and his armor bearer are going to fight against the Philistine garrison, right? They're going to go up to the Philistine garrison, and uh, they're standing now at the bottom. And Jonathan turns to his armor bearer, and he says, let us go up and fight the Philistines. And his armor bearer says, do whatever's in your heart. So Jonathan says, okay, we're going to ask for a sign. Now, as we read this, look for the circumstances in which Jonathan and his armor bearer would fight. Okay? Under what circumstances would they fight? 1 Samuel 14. It says in verse 8. 1 Samuel 14, verse 8. Then said Jonathan, behold, we will pass over unto these men, and we will discover ourselves unto them. If they say thus unto us, tarry until we come to you, then we will stand still in our place, and will not go up unto them. But if they say thus, come up unto us, then will we go up, 
for the Lord hath delivered them into our hand. This shall be a sign unto us. Now, if you just finished reading that and said, ah, they're going to fight if the Philistines said, come up unto us, you're right. But you may have missed something. Because did you notice that if the Philistines also said, tarry until we come to you, what would Jonathan and his armor bearer do? Do you think that they were going to just wait there? The Philistines were going to come and they were going to say, hey, let's play cards, right? I mean, that wasn't what they were planning on doing. The Philistines were going to come and they were going to fight. So do you notice what's very strange about this? We often think Jonathan asked for a sign as to whether or not he should fight. But in fact, when you read these verses carefully, Jonathan asked for a sign as to whether or not he was going to win. Not whether or not he was going to fight. It was only in verse 10, if they said, come up unto us, that Jonathan said, for the Lord hath delivered them into our hand. They only would know this sign was about how will we know if Yahweh is on our side? It wasn't about whether or not we'll fight. Because Jonathan lived by principle and not by result. And he said, the Philistines are the intruders. They're the Canaanites. We're supposed to drive them out. And he said, that is what God commanded. That is the principle. Get rid of the Philistines. And I'm going to do it whether or not my father supports us with the army. I'm going to fight. But the result is up to God. Now, I think that's a very powerful lesson. Very, very powerful for us. Because we often get so hung up on this idea of results, right? How often have you heard before in, in preaching that, well, we can't preach that way because it's never successful, right? It doesn't get results. And yet, what's said here in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 is the apostle said, I've planted, Apollos watered, and what happened? God gave the increase. It's not us. We don't determine these things. And you know, when you really start to think about this, as you start going through this idea of principle versus results, it's all over in Scripture. And you really run into this problem, especially when we start getting results-oriented and we look at Jesus' ministry. Because the Lord says to his disciples in Matthew chapter 16, who do men say that I am? You remember their answer? Some say you're Elijah. Some say Jeremiah. And uh, some think you're John. Do you notice what they didn't say? The Christ. And then Jesus turns to them and he says, well, who do you think I am? And they say, we know you're the Messiah. And he says, well, then let me tell you what the Messiah has to do. I'm going to be taken, crucified on the third day. And Peter says, this will not be, Lord. Don't say such a thing. Right? And so here's the Lord Jesus standing and realizing no one, he has six months left to live. No one knows who he is. If we get results oriented, then we run into the problem that the Lord Jesus converted a handful of people. Was his ministry a failure? It's not about results. Our God looks for the process. He looks for the principle. And so what he wants us to do is he wants us then to think about what are the principles involved here? How do I apply this principle? How do I apply this principle? It doesn't mean that we say, who cares about the results? But it means that we say, principles come first. Principles come first. We pray about it. We leave it in the hands of God, and we see what the results are. And I think that this is huge, because so often we say, oh, I can't go out to that person who's left the truth. I can't talk to them, because I'm going to say the wrong thing, and they're going to go away. That's not the point. The point is that you say something to them, because that's what we're commanded to do. We say, well, we can't preach. You know, we, we can't go out and we can't do public lectures anymore because nobody ever comes. That's not the point. The point is that we preach. We say, you know, well, I, I have to raise my kids in the exact right way and I have to, I have to do it like this. And that's, that's not the point. We have to apply the principles and pray to our God that he will work with our children. And so as we come and we finish all this up, we, don't, we still don't know why Hezekiah backed down. But I think that what we can see is we know our context, and overall, we realize that God is teaching Hezekiah a way to overcome. And he says, you're looking at everybody else, and you're looking back at your Passover, and you feel like you failed. That nobody learned. Nobody loves me. I'm coming against a hypocritical nation. And he says, Hezekiah, you need to learn that you applied the principle. You did what you could. And really, above all, that's what I love, rather than the results. Just wait, and I'll take care of those. <laughs>